Hello and welcome. Welcome to the second talk of the Ballarat International Photo Biennale's Conversations Online series. My name is Fiona Sweet and I'm the Artistic Director and CEO of the Ballarat International Photo Biennale. And firstly, I would like to acknowledge that the Biennale takes place on the land of the Wadarung and Jajawarung people, and I pay my respect to their elders, past, present, and emerging. The Biennale would like to thank their lead partners, Spices, Bauhaus, and Hunnamool, and our major government partners, the City of Ballarat, Creative Victoria, Visit Victoria, and the Australian Government through the RISE Fund for their ongoing support. I am so pleased to begin this conversation event discussing Alex Marie's world premiere body of work, Styx, with Alex Marie and Shoa Mavlin, Director of PhotoWorks in Brighton in the UK. Thank you both for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks for having us. But first, I'd like to introduce Alex with a short bio. Alex Marie is a multidisciplinary French artist based in London. Her work explores our relationship to bodies and their representation, with a particular interest in addressing gender stereotypes while mixing mythological references with autobiographical elements. In 2019, she was awarded the Vic Odden Prize or award by the Royal Photogra Photographic Society for a notable achievement in the art of photography by an artist aged 35 or under. Shawa Mavlen is the director of PhotoWorks. She's responsible for the strategic vision and artistic direction of the organization, including exhibitions, publishing, digital content, and learning and engagement. From 2011 to 2018, Mavlian was the Assistant Curator of Photography and International Art at the Tate Modern in London, where she curated the major exhibitions and helped build the photography collection and curated collection displays, enjoyed by over 5 million vis visitors per year. So just to let everyone know from the audience that there is a, a, a chat button and a Q&A function on the base of the Zoom. And we're more than welcome for you to post any questions and ask any questions. And these will be answered at the end of the discussion. So where do we start girls? Um, I think maybe I might start with, uh, maybe I'll start with Shoah and just maybe give a little bit of an overview of how you and I came to decide to do a project and how, uh, how Alex was chosen. I thought that might be a good start for the, for the conversation. Yeah, sure. Um, thanks so much for having us. Um, it's quite early morning in the UK, so I've got my cup of coffee with me. Um, uh, yeah, Fiona, it's really great. This is our first partnership um, between PhotoWorks and Ballarat. Um, and PhotoWorks uh, is an international platform and uh, partnerships is really like one of the key things that we do. Um, most of what we do is in partnerships with other organizations. Um, and one of my colleagues, uh, how this came about was really like a typical pre-pandemic um, scenario. Uh, one of my colleagues, Raquel, uh, was in Houston Photo Fest and um, met with you there and started that dialogue about this collaboration. So we've been through the pandemic together. PhotoWorks did our festival last year, mid pandemic. Now uh, Ballarat has, has your festival on. Um, and it was really amazing that we could kind of build that partnership together and, and particularly exciting that we were able to make a new project with Alex. Um, so really kind of giving artists opportunities to make new work, that's really important to PhotoWorks. Um, and I should say that PhotoWorks focuses primarily on early career photographers or early career artists. So um, people in the first 10 to 15 years of their practice. Um, and that's how kind of we came about working with Alex Marie. Mm. Yes, in fact, um, I had a fantastic time in Houston 
but I was only there for six days. I was meant to have a six to eight week um, exploratory visit to America, looking at artists, curators, galleries. And it was in March in 2020. So I came running back as everyone else did from the Houston, Houston Photo Fest. But yes, very fortunately met Raquel and learned so much more about what you do at uh, in PhotoWorks in Brighton, of course, not Brighton in Melbourne for those viewers from Melbourne, but Brighton in the UK. Um, I suppose it's really exciting that we've got Alex Marie uh, exhibiting here in Ballarat. We are also always excited to exhibit artists' works that are created specially for the festival, because as we know, it provides the artist with a platform to exhibit. It provides the artist with the time and focus to create new work, which is so necessary for an artist. Um, and particularly in the photographic medium world, there's a lot of artists that are repeating their works throughout the world, which is also fantastic. It's the, the sort of the notion of the touring, but I think the new works was very exciting for us. And I suppose now I'd like to talk, talk to Alex, because when we first talked, we had lots of these Zooms because it was all, it was a pandemic exhibition really. Uh, you talked about exploring Australia and, and I'd love you to talk about the discoveries that you found when you were researching Ballarat as well. And then just a little bit about the pre-work before to form sticks. Yeah, I guess with all my projects, I kind of, um, this, the first time that they will be made, the site specificity of it is uh, quite important, whether it's the architectural space or the location. Uh, and this, um, on this occasion, obviously it was really um, odd and kind of impossible task because I couldn't just research the whole of Australia um, in you know, one month without having ever been there. So I kind of concentrated on um, the chat that we had about the building, um, which uh, used to be a bank built for the gold rush. Um, and then I kind of pulled threads of research and um, which is often what I do, which is um, through films as much as kind of theory, as much as um, books um, about kind of niche subjects and kind of like try and start like this. Um, and this happened at the same time then, of course, we were in pandemic in Europe as well. And um, I had this bag of x-rays and I started thinking about the idea of the sticks and what really triggered the start of the project was the poetics of the sun um, printing through the skins and printing the inside of the human body. Um, and the cyanotype technique um, is of course developed with water and has a strong link with water. And I think throughout the whole thinking of making a show across oceans that became really present for me that the idea that it was across the world and i couldn't reach it but also the history of the travels there um so i think water and remoteness uh, became really important at the start of the project in parallel to the research that i was doing mm -hmm. and i mean also triggered by i mean all of this also was triggered by the fact that you you told me that the ceiling of the national um mm -hmm. the photography is made from a uh, shipyard metal and so it, it, i really became to think of the space as um the underneath of a ship so really to be in water mm -hmm. um that's how i was yeah thinking of it which is so accurate because it is this giant two-story space that you're in um in an in a, a non-traditional gallery space it's an old bank, it's got terrazzo floors, it's got a double height. And as I explained, all the um, ornamentation from the original 1850s building had been removed over the years. And we were left with this very, actually very much what looks like the underside of a, of a ship. Um, mm. I suppose for people who haven't seen the work, I'm wondering if it might be a good time now to talk about the work, show some of the work, and also maybe describe what you decided in terms of the concept of a, um, well, really a maze, if you like, 
just so that people can, who are coming, I see there's some people from Devon and all sorts of places from around the world who won't be able to see the work in situ in this incarnation. Yeah, I'll share my screen then. Um, but, uh, so um, this is the um, kind of maze that you're talking about. So. You can see here the ceiling that we were talking about, which is mm. of shimmer metal. And then um, the the walls are painting, painted gold, um, thanks to an amazing painting sponsor <laughs> that we had. And of course that ref like referencing as well, um, the history of the place, the city and the bank, um, but also kind of adding this um, change of light throughout the day and in the space. Uh, which of course refers to mythology, but also um, kind of sacred places uh, where we can encounter um, kind of afterlife experiences or kind of morning experiences. Um, the labyrinth in itself, um, which is a circle of structure, basically is made of uh, three uh, layers. And so when you enter on the right here, you can choose, um, this is a picture with someone in it. You can choose whether to go right or left and then the same in the second circle. And then the, the last um, layer is a single image. Um, all of um, the fabric are printed with cyanotypes, X-rays of the human body of like uh, bowels and intestines. And there was a quite, a few bits of research involved in this. Um, one was the circle structure of the labyrinth that uh, basically came from um, came from a few things. So one one thing was in um, ancient Greece, as said in um, the book of it, the book of the dead of the Odyssey. Um, the, the Greeks at some point thought of basically Earth as um, this kind of flat island and then surrounded by water and then you would cross to the afterlife. So to say that uh, on the other side, there would be all the souls of the dead. Um, and they understood that of course, that would be much more, uh, much bigger land than, than uh, the living. So um, there was this idea of water really surrounding the living. And I really like the idea of crossing to an afterlife without the kind of polarity of other religions of um, hell or heaven and the fact that it wasn't um, underground either. Um, and then um, there was also the, the, the history of um, the labyrinth, which originally came from a dance, um, <clears throat> which kind of um, is, um, is, here is the diagram which is a uh, kind of linked to the story of uh, Aryan thread again from uh, Greek mythology. But so the dancers kind of um, would um, hold their hands and do this kind of choreography that created a maze. Um, and then there was this, of course, the maze itself of the human body and of um, kind of guts and intestines. Um, and then there was the, um, in the images themselves, there was the idea of um, using X-rays and X-ray as an architecture um, because X-ray technology appeared um, at some point in history where it changed the way architects thought and it's kind of the birth of modern architecture. And all of this, like the idea of seeing through the body and transparency actually changed uh, how architects thought about buildings uh, themselves. And they, that's when they became that that's when they started using a lot of light. So I guess the overarching uh, sentiment um, or idea that I was, that was really important for the project was the idea of like going through and seeing through. So going through an experience like the pandemic or morning as much as going through water and space mm. and time and seeing through that is omnipresent throughout the show. So with the use of x-rays um, with the use of transparent fabric, with the use of the hologram in the next room that I, um, I will, well, I don't really have uh, pictures of, but I can tell you that in the, 
in the next room, basically, there is this labyrinthic corridor um, because that's where the vault room used to be. And so in there you have a hologram of a performance uh, projected as a Pepper's Ghost effect and then a sound piece, which is the monologue of um, the goddess because Tix was um, in ancient mythology, a goddess and a river. So that's kind of how I constructed the show. The river, my interpretation of the river in one room, the main room, and my interpretation of the goddess in the other. Um, and to show you how Pepper Ghost effect works, because it's one of the most um, ancient tricks, basically, um, with a projection. This is how it works, where um, in th it was used in theater in the 17th century, um, where you would just kind of project light um, onto glass at 35 degree, and that would kind of create a ghost. And today you can see that in Disneyland or uh, Coachella or um, many other occasions. We are. You know, it was a fantastic, um, it was a fantastic way that was a very much a collaborative process for us to try and create something that would suit you. And in a way, the whole idea of distance of space and distance of, of kilometres really was quite challenging in many ways, but also it allowed for opportunities because we had to go off, you know, when you talked about your hologram, we had to go off and find ways of trying to make it work and then ways of trying to explain to you how it might work, but not having any idea if it would work. And <laughs> um, with that, I suppose I want to talk to Shaar as well, because Shaar was the curator of this project and I suppose it would be good to have a, just a little chat while we're looking at the work as well, just to discuss the kinds of um, challenges, but also positive challenges uh, with working with us over here in the Southern Hemisphere on an island far, far away and how you negotiated with us and with Shoah and with the work as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, it's super interesting because I think it would be good to talk about the process of commissioning a work or like the process of yes. um, working with an artist during that period where you're not sure what you're going to get. Um, and that's actually one of the most exciting things about, um, about what PhotoWorks does and being a curator at PhotoWorks. Um, so, you know, there's, there's lots of different types of curating. Um, um, a more traditional museum type of curating is where you choose a work, you select a work that already exists and you know what it looks like, you know how it's gonna be installed and then you bring it into your museum and you, and you hang it in an exhibition. Um, and that's what I used to do at Tate Modern actually. Most of what I did at Tate was showing work that already existed. Um, and then at PhotoWorks, we really have this shift of giving artists, trying to provide opportunities for artists to make new projects that wouldn't exist without um, this type of exhibition and without this type of collaboration. Um, but what comes with that is a lot of anxiety from the curators um, because we essentially go through like a six month pro <laughs> Alex is laughing. Um, we go through a six month process of working with an artist and really not knowing what we're gonna get. Um, and that's both really exciting and like terrifying at the same time. Um, and you have to really take that uh, leap of faith and, um, and go through the process with the artist. And um, that's why it's so great that organizations like, um, like you in Ballarat, uh, really kind of take that on and embrace that. Um, and of course, most of the time it works out all fine and the work is amazing. And um, that's exactly what happened here. So we went through this process uh, working with Alex for um, six to 12 months to make this work happen. Um, and I think uh, thinking back on the process, um, Alex, you used to live in London, so we used to kind of be able to meet up and have conversations face to face quite a bit. But during the pandemic, you were in France. Um, yeah, and I, I, yeah, I guess um, in, a, in a way, this project also changed my life because in order to make the cyanotypes, I decided to um, live in the French countryside to be able to use the outdoor um, um, every day. So 
so yeah, I guess I was removed from you, <laughs> the creator, but that was the way to be able to make work. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's what you're saying about um, the, the <laughs> I never really took into account the, the anxiety of the curators. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, yeah. um, artists never do. Yeah. <laughs> it's, um, to me, it's, and I'm really grateful that um, you've accepted to let me make a new piece of work because it's completely integral to my practice that, you know, I work with, with photographic installations. So I have to have the deadline of a show to, um, and the means to, to make them because otherwise I never have the space uh, or the money to kind of try something like this. Mm. And it's kind of, um, I've realized throughout my young and small career that I always had to kind of ask and push because I think if I had never asked to make new work or like kind of, um, yeah, say that I wanted to, by now I would have still just made my degree show project that would have been exhibited and would have taught the whole time mm -hmm. because not many people are willing to take that risk. And then as an artist, you're not in a position um, often, especially if you make installations to just try it out on your own. Um, so yeah, it's really mm -hmm. important. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think sort of talking about that and then talking about um, Shamar's history of, you know, one of the best galleries in the world, of course, but so different to a festival. I mean, I think in festivals as directors, we take incredible artistic risks. And for me in particular, the bigger the artistic risk, risk the much the more excitement for me. Um, they're called risks, but they're not really risks. What they are is they're just uh, stepping over the over the over the footpath onto the road and of course looking both ways but certainly exploring and I think that um, for many people they don't always understand why um, these soft arts or these festivals are so important both for artists and for audiences but what it does is it creates this um, opportunity for new work often as we're doing here for Alex in a very unusual space so you get to kind of play with something quite different, particularly here in Ballarat where, you know, all the spaces are non-gallery spaces. And also there's this sort of mass, well, pre-COVID of course, but a little bit warming now, this idea of mass audiences seeing the artist's work as well. And I want to talk to you, Alex, about the idea of audience because festival directors always talk about audience. We talk about audience, but we also talk about art, artists. Well, my three A's are, Artist, of course, art and audience, because for us, it's about supporting the artist to do their new work, making sure that, you know, that they are funded and supported. It's about the art form being represented, but equally important, it's about audiences coming to see that artist's work so the artist's career can grow. And I think that's been quite a shift with galleries too, but I wonder whether you ever, like you've created this very beautiful uh, series of circles. And I suppose I'd love to hear from you about the idea of what you expect people to do as they communicate through, because it's not, it's not something that's on the wall, is it? It's not like walk in, look at the picture on the wall or look at the sculpture on the floor. I mean, you've very much, I believe, considered the idea of the audience within this. So it's not just a sculpture. It's not just a photograph, it's very much public art inside, which I really love. So I thought you could talk about that. If you like. Yeah, yeah, it's just funny when you say audience as in growing the audience, which from a curator and director point of view is very nice for an artist to hear. But for me, the reason why I make art is for people. Like, you know, I, that's an argument that uh, you all often have in art school, you know, what is an artist, what is an outsider artist? And to me, a key of, um, a key thing of making art and not, you know, just doing it on my own um, in my spare time is because I make it for people to kind of experience. And throughout my work, um, there is something specific that I've tried to create, which is um, immersive experiences for the audience member as a body. So um, when making work, I always kind of pay attention to scale and how the body of the audience member will react to the work. 
Mm. Um, and so in this, in this instance, you know, like I kind of try to imagine that the fact that when people walk in, the fabric will move and that will activate it. The fact that you can choose whether to go right or left, um, what is going to be the last thing inside that they will see, um, which uh, I don't know if I have mentioned, but um, maybe not incredibly readable in this picture, but is an x-ray of um, a fetus of a pregnant uh, lady. Um, and, um, and then, yes, also with the labyrinth and the hologram and the sound piece not being attached to the video, I guess it's, I always try to make bodily experiences. And I, mean, I don't have expectations of um, the exact reaction that I want. Um, all I'm trying to do is to get a reaction, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> is to, um, to kind of like offer an experience um, that is out of the everyday, I guess. And I've had like with past work, incredibly different feedbacks of whether it was uncomfortable or like eerie or actually, um, you know, when I met a fountain installation, some someone said that they wanted to shower in there, whereas others were like um, a bit overwhelmed with the sound, like every time it changes. And I guess that's how I know that something works in the, in the piece is when people actually tell me their reactions, bodily reactions. Mm. 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 And I suppose the next thing I was going to talk to you about is the notion of accident. Because you talk mm. a, a little bit about accident and the joy of accident and mm. how you develop ideas maybe not always, but sometimes through the notion of accidents and whether you want to go through a little bit about the kind of accidents or the, the process of accidents, whether it's about the medium and the chemicals or it's about the fabric or the technique. Um, I'm sure people would like to know a little bit more about that, that too. Because of course, this is, you know, cyanotypes created, then scanned and then printed. Oh, there you go. You, you talk about it because you've got the pictures, great. Um, I guess um, maybe accident wasn't the right word, but I guess what I wanted to, to talk about is process. So my um, how I work is that I will uh, at the same time do a lot of research. So in here, you know, for example, the when I decided or I, when I started to think about cyanotype and X-ray together and transparency, you know, then I looked at x-ray architecture, labyrinth, um, the story of sticks in Greek mythology, the history of the color blue that became really important mm -hmm. um, because it has linked blue. In ancient Egypt, blue was made with copper and the hologram has copper wings mm -hmm. um, and it was funerary objects um, in the thrums. Then in Roman times, blue is the color of mourning. And then by um, the Middle Ages in France and throughout Europe, blue becomes, blue and gold basically are the same thing because they're really expensive to produce and they become the color associated with afterlife and in all the worship places. So all of this um, research, those of research kind of uh, keep me going and help with decision-making. And then of course you have the materials and the actual physical process of making the work. Um, so this picture uh, gives a, a little bit of an idea of, I think I made about 300 cyanotypes in the end to get the right one and to understand, um, you know, like at the end, at first I was making them like really clean and then I decided that I wanted a bit of, um, that no mistakes, but yeah, chance. So like, for example, the, these marks um, and the fact that the, to let them drip, to have like the idea of water are kind of coming back um, and, and also, you know, scale weight. So all of this, basically every step of the process you test and then you kind of change direction or choose. Uh, it's the same with the x-rays. I had some, but I had to look for way more uh, once I decided uh, what I wanted. So then you kind of start emailing hundreds of doctors. Uh, and then, uh, so, you know, to kind of show you this was one of the first one I made on fabric because I tested, which is just kind of drying um, outdoor in the countryside. Because um, of course, ideally I would have loved to make them just 
each one of them myself on fabric, but it's just that financially that's just mad production. So then yes, you start thinking, okay, then I will make them on paper, I will scan them, I will print them and all of those steps basically. So it's not, um, it's not accidents per se, but it's more about it. My practice is very much process based. And so the work can change every time that something happens in the studio physically, uh, which is a very different way of working you know, compared to the people I studied with, for example, that would plan a photo shoot and a picture for months and they knew exactly how they wanted the light, you know, where it came from, like the, all those technical aspects. And I'm a bit more of a, I experiment, I experiment a bit more, I guess. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And also, can I just add to that? Um, what, I've found really interesting working with you is that it does start like in this very small scale studio handmade process um, with you as the artist physically like testing and trying thing by hand. Um, and then what's really exciting is seeing how you are willing to hand that over and like think about it on a larger scale and work with um, technicians and you know, in, industrial type processes in order to in order to take that from the scale of the handmade artist studio to the scale of something that can be displayed in public um, on, you know, on a much, much bigger um, space. Yeah, I guess, well, I mean, there's two things in that is like, one, I do make a lot of, I mean, all the work that I can myself in the studio. So I would not be able to or capable to do so, like some artists just design and have it produced because because of this idea of chance and accidents I need to try loads of different things and see where the direction go before deciding this is what it needs to be so I wouldn't be able to kind of uh, really like have amazing uh, you know like writing notes and describe exactly how it would look like before doing a lot of uh, legwork in the studio on a small scale and then basically I guess specifically with that show because um, it's the first time that um, to respond to the space I kind of decided to go with the labyrinth structure that needed to hang from the ceiling and the hologram etc. I, um, I worked with a, a couple of architects to like help me with the measurements and make the plans and sketch up um, but it felt very much like it was the first one of the first time that indeed it was it was going to be constructed but also I wouldn't be able to see uh, and be there during the construction because usually what happens with a even a large scale structure is that I once I someone helps me a fabricator or um, someone to install I'm there I, I mean I'm there so I can kind of make last minute decision or stuff like that um, but I think yeah I'm not once I know what I want the work to do um, then that's what's important and I'm not very, uh, um, you know, like, um, I don't know if anal is the right word, but uh, precise on um, the, the little details, um, which I think is kind of um, realistic also to just kind of go with the people that know their trade and know how it's going to work um, and not, you know, like kind of invent uh, hanging structures that wouldn't physically <laughs> be possible and stuff like that. Mm. I suppose it'd be good to see some of your other photographs that you've got here. Uh, have you got other photographs on your slideshow that you want to show us in terms of process? Um, I have this one, which is a picture from the silent movie Faust, uh, which <gasps> is the, where the three kind of rings of fire of how it came from alongside um, my favorite film, which uh, basically is Dracula from Coppola and Dracula bor uh, Coppola borrowed the three rings from Faust in this scene. So you can see like the rings, the blue rings of fire mm. uh, in there. And then I have um, talking about experiments, uh, the very first DIY um, test of the pepper ghost effect in, um, in France, so this is the performer holding a piece of perspex, so holding herself 
um, kind of trying the 35 degree angle um, in the process of which we broke my parents' TV, that <laughs> which was kind of the most expensive part of the test. Um, and then I think those are just um, close-ups basically of the um, cyanotypes. Um, mm. So you can see them a bit mm. better than and then still shots. Mm. Yeah, no, no, no. Um, with that. Yes, I think that's it. Mm. And Shoah, did you want to have anything else you want to talk about in terms of the process or as a curator? Um, yeah, I guess it's interesting to kind of um, touch on. So Alix and I have worked together before um, on two smaller projects. And I, I would say Alix for quite a uh, quite a long time in your career you kind of were working with the outside of the body and um, you know the skin tone and and flesh and and things like that um, and what was really interesting about this project is that this is kind of a turning point in your practice looking now looking back in retrospect um, visually aesthetically it's really different to um, it's really different to a lot of your other work um, it doesn't have that kind of uh, fleshy uh, skin type um, external representation of the body, which I think if someone was to describe your practice, um, that's what they would kind of think was your trademark. So this is super interesting, actually, from a curatorial perspective, watching you take that shift um, and move into a slightly different direction. Um, and I'm really excited to see where that goes now. Mm. Well, I, thanks. Um, well, there's, I think the duality between inside and outside has always been an obsession. Um, so whether for Maman, for example, which is a tent, it is pictures of the outside, but you go inside to view the work. Then in La Femme Fontaine also, there was this play between the inside and outside, between the sculptures and the prints. So that's definitely something that's um, always been there, at least for me. And then with the, um, but you, of course, you're, you're right in saying that I've ma mostly worked about um, skin and, um, well, at least the outside, which is um, something that it really interested me at first, the kind of the idea of thinking of the print, the photographic print as surface um, and as sacred as skin, because I observed that as soon as you would damage a print of a body, then people reacted to it really viscerally as if you were damaging the body. Um, of course, it, I guess, thinking about it now, it's also, it was a bit technical as well. I mean, that's what I can photograph. <laughs> it's the outside of bodies, because um, unfortunately I'm not a surgeon. But um, there is also the, I think for this, but to talk in real terms, at the very, at the very beginning of the project um, and just, you know, throughout anyway, I decided also that I really wanted to um, make the work about bodies university. Um, and I didn't want any kind of uh, difference in skin color. I just wanted to talk about like humanity. Um, so without having kind of this uh, selection or like obvious kind of uh, geographic point reference. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Well, I think it's probably time now to um, take some questions from uh, the Q&A from the attendees. And we've got a few questions that um, were um, written before. Um, and the first one was, was it challenging to produce the work without being there in person in Australia? And of course, We've sort of touched on that, but maybe is there something more you might like to add? Well, very challenging. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I guess the challenge is for the three of us to indeed com communicate and make it happen um, technically and all of this. And then personally, as an artist, it's, um, it's a very 
um, frustrating feeling to create installations that kind of are supposed to react with the body and not being able to experience it myself. Mm. And also what I found with the pandemic is um, I've been really lucky that um, none of the projects were canceled. They were just postponed and I've had like quite a lot of shows, but of course I didn't go to any of them. So I just kind of became a post office for just shipping works and getting them back. Mm. And that um, on top of, I guess, living in the countryside, um, it became really, it, it, it also really influenced, you know, like you're isolated on many different levels. And to me, not to be able to talk about art, also just, you know, like colleagues and peers and seeing other and sharing with the community or the audience uh, really showed me how um, that's, you know, more than half of the work, of, of the fun of the work and how you socially, it's incredibly important. Um, yeah. Well, we've had, um, including you, we've had three curated exhibitions where the curators and the artists have not been here. Yeah. Oh, four, actually, four. Four large group shows, one solo, where the artists and the curators have not been here. Hmm. And it's been such a challenge. And the biggest challenge is just making everyone feel really confident and comfortable and secure that we will do everything in our power to actually um, envisage, envision the, the, the realities of what the artist wants. Because of course, that's really important. I mean, that's why we're here. We're here to ensure that the artist's work is represented in a way that they're very happy. Mm -hmm. So yes, I know it's been, oh God, I can't wait till it's over. Now, the next question is for you, Sha'a. It's, um, it's a question from Hilary and she talks about the term support. And she wants to know, it's used here when talking about the artist, and she wants to know whether you're talking about paying the artist as the support, or are there other types of support when curating? Yeah, that's a really good question. Mm. Um, it means all of those things. So definitely the financial support is important for artists. Mm. Um, and at PhotoWorks, we pay artists for everything that we ask them to do. So um, we're really transparent about that. And that's because we understand that, you know, it takes a lot of labor to make um, art and to make these projects, um, but also support in like a much wider sense. So uh, PhotoWorks and Ballarat um, Biennial, uh, Biennale, we provide an infrastructure for artists and and that in itself is is like a, a um, when it works well that is a support system for artists so uh, we're we're essentially here to answer any questions that the artist has during the whole period of time that we're making work we're here to check in with the artist to build a relationship with them to be a sounding board um, both conceptually and technically so um, you know, and, and we all play different roles in that. So uh, from a curatorial perspective, um, myself and Raquel have been having lots of conversations with Alix conceptually about the project and helping that develop along into the physical exhibition. Um, and then the team in Ballarat have really been there to kind of physically, technically support the exhibition coming to life. Um, and I guess what's really important about this is that there's so many people involved um the artist obviously is the center of that and and is the one that is communicating with everyone but it is this kind of system of support that really makes um these type of projects happen mm. and I, and I, as also um i mean i have my own kind of bubble of support of like so many friends and family have been involved in the project and help so yeah. and i think to add to that also there's also the idea of challenging an artist. I mean, we don't want to do that too often, but we also want to be able to have those discussions that, um, that it's not about questioning, it's more about opportunities for other things to happen. And they might be quite either peripheral, for example, Alex, the gold walls. Remember, we had the discussion, the walls were white. You said, I think if I remember correctly, you were happy with white. And I remember, maybe I think I said, they can be any color you like. 
Do you remember that? We had this little discussion. And then at one point you said, you mean they could be gold? Do you remember that? And I said, you know, I had a little five second think about the technique of painting gold because it's actually, for those of you who haven't been, it's, it's two layers of gold paint and then there's gold leaf sort of in a very 1980s rough finish to get the gold to reflect. And so uh, Alex said uh, gold and I, you know, took a, a few minutes or a few seconds and I said, yeah, gold. And really it's extraordinary, isn't it? I mean, I was quite surprised at that. <laughs> and I <added>. so <laughs> we don't do anything. We just pose as well, which some artists say absolutely not. And some of them say absolutely not and come back and say possibly. And other times it's that wonderful, I think it's that wonderful dialogue. And so, yes, I think to answer that question, the support comes in many ways, but like PhotoWorks, we are very strictly um, a payment uh, organisation too, and all artists are paid a fee to exhibit, and we also pay for the production costs as well, because we recognise that just paying for production costs means that people can't pay for their food and their rent. You know, it's, it's a profession. Uh, okay, my, uh, we're going to wrap up soon. So if there's any other questions, please put them in. But I have one more, which is the last, uh, which is, do you find it helpful as an artist to have the support of festivals behind your new work? And that's for you, Alex. Um, well, yeah, as I said, without um, the commission coming from both of you, the work would not exist. So it's very important. <laughs> um, I think this is the, it's a luxury that I, you know, don't get every time, but um, to be asked in advance um, to make, to, to make a show and then basically it becomes a conversation about, okay, well, do you want old work or can I make new work and kind of um, pay attention to this? Um, in my personal um, practice, it's really important because, I, as I said, I pay attention to the place and the architecture and kind of uh, site specificity of it, or how to rework a pro already existing project uh, for a space. Um, so yeah, to me, it's a kind of essential. Mm. Mm. I mean, of course, um, I'm hoping this exhibition will tour. I know it will be the second incarnation, it won't be a new work, but I do hope that this exhibition does get its opportunity to tour. It's a very um, easy exhibition to tour because it's a little bit of fabric and some digital and some fabulous sound. So we hope very much that we can help and support the touring of your exhibition. And with that, of course, I'd like to say to both of you, thank you so much for the insightful conversation and particularly so early in the morning for you in the Northern Hemisphere and for our audiences in the Northern Hemisphere, also thank you waking up so early. And we're really excited to have that deeper look into Alex, into your photographic practice and the processes that comes with presenting a new body of work over the past 18 months, of course, during the pandemic. Uh, thank you everyone for tuning in. There are more events coming up as part of the Conversations Online series. Next up is an artist talk with Dutch artist and designer Eric Kessels and the Australian Graphic Design Association. If you haven't done so already, you can register to attend via our website. All of our talks will also be recorded and made available following the event, and you'll be able to access, access these via our website. And for example, for this um, talk, hopefully via the Photo Works website too. For those wishing to visit the Biennale in person, the festival has now been extended until the 9th of January 2022, and you can pre-purchase your tickets through the website. We hope to welcome you to Ballarat soon, and thank you once again for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you.